If for whatever reason you missed in season 3, Azula lied to Toph, and she's not the only one to successfully lie to her. Old Sweepy is as well. He explained that there might have been a animal like Appa sent to Whale Tail Island when that was entirely false. It turns out on the Nick Encyclopedia that Old Sweepy was an undercover Dai Li agent who kept an eye on the lower ring to spread misinformation. Also did this to get into good graces of Long Fang again because he got banished. So Toph's ability lacked here, but an episode where it didn't lack was during Sokka's master episode because she bent the Nick logo with the Space Earth Rock. Something that isn't as cool, probably more gross and funny, is back in season 2 when Toph is talking about how to act in high society, she's openly picking her nose, flicks the booger to the top of the ceiling, and then what's even funnier is seconds later, many seconds later, you see this booger fall on Sokka when he's just laying there talking. And while we're in season 2, there's a character that's very infamous for that season, and that's Judy because of obviously, there is no war in Ba Sing Se. But anyways, with Judy, you didn't see her again after season 2, right? Well, that's actually incorrect because she was in a comic after season 2, but before season 3. Azula actually met her and decided to place her in charge of Ba Sing Se. She was given the title Supreme Bureaucratic Administrator, and she would take any order from Ozai. Now, this is quite the accomplishment for Azula to take over Ba Sing Se and for Judy to get this promotion. But an individual who didn't receive an accomplishment was Zhao. Obviously, he wanted to be known in the history books is the greatest and in the end he got completely forgotten in the ember island players episode the only time he gets brought up is the scene of him dying he's not brought up by name you don't even see the main cast reference him and to add to this even more ang's kids didn't even remember him during Korra season two while we're on the topic of ember island players though we do see ang wearing a very similar hat to the one that shu wears in the painted lady obviously ang shaved his head in the invasion episode so it makes sense he would wear a hat here but it's it's not confirmed that this hat is the same, but many speculate that it is the same hat. A funny thing that actually happened on the official Nickelodeon website has to do with the list of all the characters, and specifically Iroh himself. Now you'd expect a picture of Iroh from book 1, book 2, book 3, well that's actually false, because if you look at this right here, this is Iroh from the Boy in the Iceberg play, the Iroh actor, and this was up for a good amount of time, and everyone had some good laughs with this, thankfully though, this was later corrected. And I guess depending on how you look at it, one thing that wasn't corrected had to do with Iroh becoming Fire Lord because Ozai stole the throne from him, right? Well, that's actually false once again because Iroh did become Fire Lord for a temporary period of time. During the Search comic, Zuko takes Azula and Team Avatar to find his mother. During this time, puts Iroh in charge as acting Fire Lord. During this time, Iroh didn't do too much, really just created a National Tea Appreciation Day, but you see a little bit more help from Iroh during the Smoke and Shadow comic. Beyond this though, Zuko forever will be the Fire Lord and then obviously Fire Lord Izumi. Going back to the past a little bit with Iroh, there was an original idea to air an episode dealing with Iroh's past, and so many people have talked about their desire for this episode, but sadly, the idea was dropped, and I feel like around episode 9, 10 of season 2, that probably would have been a perfect time for it, but since we got Zuko alone, maybe the creators didn't see much of a point for that. Still staying in the past with Iroh, we're gonna go over Lu Ten, and the memorial that Iroh had for him in the Tales of Ba Sing Se episode. As we know, there's a picture of Lu Ten with some writing, this was actually a letter, and the translation of this letter says, General Iroh, I will see you again when victory is obtained. Your loyal son, Lu Ten. Another interesting Iroh fact has to do with his Filipino, Dutch, Russian, and Turkish dubs. He's actually the one that said previously on Avatar, not Avatar Roku. It was changed there. And while we're on the topic of dubs, did you know that in Greek, Katara's name is actually Tamara? Because the word Katara means curse. Also, Aang's Russian voice actress voiced Korra as well. And while we talk about Korra, we have to discuss how Korra's name came to be, because the creators actually had a difficult time coming up with this. They could never agree until they went to an eco lodge, and they met the owner's dog there named Korra. They decided to go with it, but this is not nearly as insane as the coincidence I'm about to go over. The voice actress for four-year-old Korra was also named Korra. She had the exact same name, just spelled differently. And to add on to this, the voice actor for Appa, Momo, all the animals, D. Bradley Baker, he's the father of this voice actress. This is his daughter who voiced Korra. In terms of voice acting connections, that was not the last one we had to go over. We've got another one that has to do with Azula. If you did not know, one of the royal servants feeding cherries to Azula was also voiced by Azula's voice actress. Obviously in this scene, there was a cherry pit and the servant got banished. So it's just funny to see Azula essentially banishing herself. Now Azula may have been quite cruel here, but there's a scene that she wasn't cruel, actually showed a ton of compassion, and this was during the beach episode for Ty Lee. Ty Lee is expressing herself, obviously, 
obviously, and she shows sadness looking towards her. Ty Lee looks directly at her. Azula closes her eyes and pretends she doesn't care, but then when Ty Lee looks away, Azula opens one eye and looks again to make sure that she's okay. Another really nice thing has to do with Azula's original concept photo. She was going to wear armor with a heavy phoenix theme, although the idea was later scrapped, which is unfortunate. I feel like at some point they should have at least had her wear it once. And obviously in The Legend of Korra, there are many characters that we wanted to show up but never did, and Azula was one of them. We didn't even see her in the Korra comics, but apparently we could have seen her or we will see her. According to a Dark Horse editor, they imagine old Azula as she's kept tabs on her brother all these years and scoffs over her morning paper whenever he's mentioned. So it hasn't happened yet, and there's obviously more Korra comics coming, so it's entirely possible we see older Azula at some point. We've been talking a bit about Azula, and we even talked about Ty Lee earlier, so let's dive into Ty Lee a little bit. Did you know that her name in Mandarin Chinese was translated as calm and beautiful? And let's go into a kind of half a fact and kind of a theory. During the Chibi Show, which is a non-canon show for little kids, Ty Lee and Haru quote-unquote got together. There's tons of theories about Ty Lee being the mother of Pema and marrying someone from the Earth Kingdom. She could have went with Haru, she could have gone with somebody else, or Pema's not related at all. But for them to set that up in a non-canon story, the theories are definitely going to pile up. And speaking of relationships, after the series finale, Zuko and Mei broke up. And this was during the Promise comic, but then three years later in Avatar time, it was implied, not confirmed, that they got back together. And this was according to one of the writers of the comics. While we're on the topic of Zuko, do you remember during season three when Iroh was locked up, he was in prison? Well, he technically wasn't in prison at all. Zuko was. If you actually look at the prison bars, every time him and Iroh have a conversation, they're always zoomed up to Zuko's face and never Iroh's. And this makes sense due to the conflict that he's dealing with. Also, when Zuko learns about his great grandfathers, the prison bar pans over his unscarred side and scarred side when talking about both. Also, when Zuko returns home, you only see his scarred side walking, but then when he leaves in the invasion, walking away from his father, you only see the unscarred side, showing the internal conflict has been resolved. While we're on the topic of scars, let's talk about Aang's scar on his back. If you didn't notice, that scar was drawn to get smaller and smaller as the season progressed. Secondly, Aang received a scar on his left foot from Azula in the season 2 finale. This scar was still shown multiple times in season 3 with scenes that were unrelated, like when Aang went down the water slide or just randomly training. Also, when it comes to Zuko's scar, originally he was going to have a bigger scar. It was going to cover up half of his face, not just the eye and ear portion of his face, and he was going to have a smaller ponytail, but obviously this design never went through. The couple that Team Avatar met in the Serpent's Pass also met Zuko, and Zuko alone multiple episodes prior, Zuko saw them from a distance. He was thinking of taking food from them, decided not to, and multiple episodes later, him and Iroh actually came into contact with this family with obviously their newborn child. While we're on the topic of Team Avatar, we're going to circle back around to Katara and Zuko a little bit because between books two and three, she spent hours a day healing Aang and doubted her abilities. When you read this, you really start to understand her hate towards Zuko. Her reaction to him is much more justified. This next detail is very minor and probably wouldn't have affected the story too much, but Katara was intended to be 12 years old at first. Same thing happened with Aang. He was originally going to be a 10 year old boy, but after discussions, they aged him up to 12. Remember the pirate crew Katara quote unquote stole the waterbending scroll from? Well, in the comics, we met the cousin of this pirate right here, who confronts her about what took place, and Katara just kind of tells him how it is. It's not your business. In terms of special items, we got to go over the special tiara that Momo gave Katara back in the Blue Spirit episode. Katara wanted water because they were sick and this is what Momo gave her instead, but this wasn't the end of the tiara as Momo held on to it in the Swamp episode. He threw it at the Swamp Benders. Another special item that actually comes from the pirates as well is this monkey statue. It mesmerized Katara and Iroh really liked it to the point where he purchased it. And you see it episodes later on Zuko's ship next to Iroh during the Blue Spirit episode. And you'd think that's the end of it because Zuko's ship got blown up. Then in season 3 during the Runaway episode, all of a sudden Team Avatar has it. It leaves you to believe did Iroh give it to them? Did they buy one that's very similar? Did the pirates steal it back before the ship blew up and sell it again? Who knows? During the Serpent's Pass, Sokka didn't want to kiss Suki in front of the moon because he felt guilty about what happened and he also didn't want her to see that. While we're on the topic of Suki, her eye color actually changes multiple times throughout the series. Sometimes it's green and sometimes it's blue. And Hama's another character with different eye color. Her eyes were not blue but gray. Continuing on the topic of Hama, during the Puppet Masters episode when Katara was talking about how Hama reminds her of Gran Gran, you actually see her holding
holding a cabbage, which has the face of either Grand Grand or Hama, which is quite interesting. And as we're on cabbages, we gotta talk about the cabbage merchant. He wanted to enter Ba Sing Se, but he was denied entry. If he allowed one cabbage slug to enter Ba Sing Se, it could destroy the entire ecosystem. Moments later, the cabbages were confiscated, and in a quick moment, if you slow it down and maybe pause it, you can see a cabbage slug flying off the cabbages. Also, the cabbage man isn't exactly who you think he is. He actually wasn't intending to sell cabbages forever. That was going to be temporary. His long-term plan was to sell cantaloupes. We're obviously on the topic of food, so we got to continue. During the Great Divide episode, an Avatar extra stated that Aang's favorite food was egg custard tart. And did you know that Aang's name in Chinese actually means peaceful soaring? And we're on to the final three. These last three all have to do with the finale. So when Aang trapped Ozai, before he took his bending away, Ozai tried to attack one last time by breathing fire at him, and Aang immediately blew it away with his airbending. Many assumed it was a combination of the elements, but it was actually Ozai himself. Obviously, moments later, we see energy bending, and this was thanks to the lion turtles. We actually got foreshadowing of the lion turtles all the way back in the library episode. There's pictures of the lion turtles, Team Avatar talks about them, and even in the unaired pilot, you see the lion turtles. Remember when Aang went to the fire temple to meet Roku? There was a fire stage that helped them get to the door to open it. The fire Sage said that he needed to be a fully realized avatar to open it. But in the series finale, when Aang was in the avatar state to defeat Ozai, you can see five different fire blasts, indicating that he was finally powerful enough. 